going in that fight, I don't think anybody thought you were going to win. I should have been some people. You thought you were going to win. Most people didn't think that you were going to win. Story of my life, right? Yeah. And you, you know, I look at it now as, you know, really you had the greatest comeback in UFC history. Dominic Cruz, welcome to the podcast. Cool, man. You got a nice setup here. Thanks. You know, we've been working on it for a little while. The, mm -hmm. the team did it. They did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's all your stuff. So yeah. it's like weird things you bought over time pretty much, exactly, right? Exactly. So that's what makes it cool. <clears throat> it's all the stuff you like. Talk about the Rocks. weird things that we buy over time. Yeah, I got a rock, a random rock. <laughs> really fancy. Got some good books, you know. You like the word bougie, right? I mean, you know, when I think of Dominic Cruz, I think bougie. No, you don't. <laughs> What's funny is I was just talking to a homie out there. I can't remember his name. Um, he was like, yeah, I mean, he's got all this fancy stuff in here because you got all the, the waters, the penny waters in there. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's always got all this fancy stuff. I'm like, you know, we all need one of those, though, because it's like you – I'll always be the first to, you know, oh, bougie Ed, like watch out with his pinky ring, right? Ah, but I don't have a pinky ring. <laughs> you know what I mean? Always <laughs> like, like this everywhere he goes, um, you may kiss the ring. No. But at the same time, you kind of, like I'm always like, he's like, yeah, he ordered like $100,000 in marble to put on the walls over there. I'm just shaking my head and I'm like, thanks, Ed, because I would never look at that marble if it wasn't for you. I would never have the nice mansion life or the, a lot of this, because, you know, some of us just don't, I wouldn't say never, but it's not something that would, I would have around me unless somebody wanted it. So if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have all this nice stuff around me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to have one of you and all your friends and all my friends, you got to have one bougie friend so that I can be like, okay, I'm not going to complain. There we go. I'll partake. There we go. You'll partake. I'll yeah, partake exactly. easily. And it's a you good know? time, right? Every time. Every time. It's, it's like the next fancy. It's just a different experience when you go with that. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Uh, we, you still know I, I can sleep on a couch, too. That's what's cool about you, yeah. You're a little far away from that now, but <laughs> so it, might be a little, it might have to be a Tempur-Pedic couch. Ah. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't but, that long ago. But I do know that guy, and he's in there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, for he's sure. in there. He just goes Southpaw now. Yeah, uh, yeah so he, he, <laughs> he throws out the Southpaw. Uh, Dom and I were, uh, we were, you know, just shadow boxing, sparring. And the thing, if you've been away for training for a long time, like me, like you still have in the back of your head that you, you still got it. <laughs> well, I think it's in all men, right? You can't give that up. You can't like logic. Your ego is part of us and it can't logically <clears throat> give that piece up. Yeah. You'd die. Yeah. But that's, that's probably, yeah, that's, that's true. But yeah, you, you know, we we're like moving. I feel good, you know, conventional stance, but you, you changed the Southpaw and I was like, oh, you're messing everything yeah. up. I have no <laughs> chance now. Well, you were like, come on, <laughs> come on. And you did that right That's off the, pretty good. yeah, That's you're pretty good. come on. And you started to do this real hard and, and you're like showing me the right hand. And I was like <laughs> <laughs> laughing in my head, like, okay, switch. And you, your whole face just was like, why'd you do that? Yeah. And it's like, that's what it feels like in real life. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It does feel like that. You're just like, man, you just took away everything I was looking for. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it's part of it. I was actually, uh, one of my old fighters, a guy named Lance Patrick, has a local school here. Uh, I had him coming over to do private lessons for, you know, Muay Thai lessons with me. <clears throat> same thing. I was like, I'm still, you know, the same. I can at least move. And the reaction time is just so much slower. And, um, you know, I kind of took it for granted for a long time, I think. Youth? Yeah, youth. And just, you know, you don't realize that by training every day for most of your life, you know, you just react differently. And then, you know, you take 10 years off and you're not going to. Yeah. Well, the, um, it, like, I'll get done with the fight and it, it'll be gone in two weeks. You'll be. Your abs are gone and you're literally the cardio, the elite cardio that you were in goes down by loads and you become human again almost. Yeah. It's very interesting. Two weeks after 12 weeks of consistent perfection. doesn't It doesn't mean anything in two weeks. It's gone. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. It's just like that. So it's 
knowing that and feeling that has kept me in a lot of the practices that work in my life a lot more. Once I physically could feel that it only takes two weeks to fall off and like actually have the experiential learning of that, which is what you were just explaining, which is like, I'll go fight at the highest level of life and win. And then two weeks later, I'm getting beat up by somebody in there because my timing's off. They're out jabbing me. They're out low kicking me when I try to jab. They're timing shots and taking me down. Possibly. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but like if that happens, it's like you feel it, you come out and you're like, man, how in two weeks am I getting so winded when I was just doing what I did? And then it teaches you like, well, that's all it takes to lose the sharpness. Literally. I mean, you just feel it, you experience it. And then um, I found over all the course of my career, you, every time you get done with the fight, your brain says, just keep this. Don't, 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 you don't want to let it go. You don't want to let go that level of elite, of being shredded, of feeling good, of feeling on top of the world. But then on the other half, your body just wants to eat and have a beer and relax and take a vacation. And it's like, your body doesn't know what to do. But in that two weeks, most of the time I'll fall off and of what I wish that I could do and stay elite. And like, you know, I'll have a couple drinks and I'll eat some of that barbecue and I'll do this and have the cake. And then it turns into two pieces of cake over two weeks and then you lose it. And then you're like, man, I wonder if I would have stayed on the exact diet for the next two weeks, would I feel worse or better because I needed the rest and I needed those, those things or would I still be as sharp or would I fall off? Like, cause you know, you say you peak and then you have to come, you have to come down. So maybe I'm just declining because I'm supposed to. Your body can't stay in that elite space for like too long or you just wither away into nothingness, but then you don't want to let go of it. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah. And I don't want to let go of it. It's the weirdest thing. And I just say we, because I talked to a lot of other athletes that were in like, we talk about that, like, man, I know. Yeah. You wish you were, but I know you won't. Like we talk to each other that way. And, um, in the end, it's like, the more times I've felt that and fallen off, felt that fall. And then finally I'll have that one fight where I'll stay with it for three weeks. Right. And I finally did it of 26 fights or whatever. You have that one fight where you finally stick it out and you try to stay elite and then you feel the difference and you book a fight right away. And then you book it. And then you're like, okay, like maybe I can just fight more consistently if I can keep this, but then just give it a small break. Just don't break all the way. Just break a little bit. Right. Don't, don't break off the deep end. And so that's kind of, I've transferred that mentality. That's like, to me, a championship mentality, a professional mentality. Um, rather than falling all the way off, give yourself some perks, but not all of the perks. And then you can kind of stay there without burning at, the, at both ends. You're still getting the fun. You're still getting the relaxation. You're still getting some of the stuff, but you're not just giving up and uh, surrendering to what the world does. You know, you, you do have to have, I do have to have a level of professionalism mixed into it. So as I follow that, that I experienced in fighting and then take that to my regular life, um, it's kept me in habits that maybe I wouldn't want to be in because my mind tells me I know I need to do it more to get it. So like I'll stay in places that a lot of people are like, why are you still here doing this right now? Like why you've been here? So And it's because I have a mentality of practice of just just show up and practice and you stay sharp. It doesn't even mean I necessarily need it. I mean, I've been doing double legs, one twos, back arches, stretching my hamstrings since I was born hmm. and I'm still doing it. Why would I change that in my regular life with the things that work? Mm -hmm. Those, so martial arts for me has been a, I don't call it, it was fighting in the early times and then it turned to martial arts as I matured and I started to learn I was on a bigger journey. When, when did you figure that one out? when I hurt my knees and had to come back. Uh, so we, what year was that? Like probably. Man, you know, I really do need to go back and do like a time lapse of all the things. Cause I haven't done that. Yeah. Actually I was going to kind of you know, go over a lot of that in the, you know, in, in the interview, you're kind of breaking that down. Like, I don't know how to do it. I haven't, I'd have to have like internet probably to like say, when did this happen? Because my brain kind of looks at everything as one big blob of mm -hmm. everything. Well, I mean, you know, we first met around, we'll do around then, around 2007. Um, you were training with Mike Eason, who's one of my teammates at the time in Maryland. Yeah. 
Love Mike. And uh, yeah, I love Mike too. Just yeah. saw just kicked it with him recently. He's in DC <clears throat> doing good. Oh, nice. Yeah, I haven't seen Mike in in years now. But He's doing great. great saw guy. the whole family. I love good. it. Good, good, good. Yeah, and so uh, you know. Uh, and you've heard me tell this story before, but I was like, oh, you know, I, I saw you training with him. I was like, ah, he's okay. I'm okay. It was, I wasn't that impressed mm -hmm. in, you know, the, the first time. And, uh, but then, you know, of course, got to know you a little better and then understood really kind of big picture, like what, what I think makes you way different. And, you know, then we weren't near as close, but it was still a, a respect and like, I'm always analyzing you. You're an analyzer. Mm -hmm. I'm an analyzer too. Like what makes this guy so successful? And well, I wasn't successful in 2007. I, I had actually just lost. Well, this is, this is the, like, as I sort of follow, it was the first time I met you though. So I wasn't impressed when I, when I first saw you, but you turned into, you know, one of the greatest champions uh, ever. I mean, you had the greatest comeback mm -hmm. of all time. There's not even a close, second to your story you've overcome more adversity to become a champion than any fighter uh that that i know of um but i guess at the time though i was looking at like you know what what do i think makes you uh a champion and it was you know obviously your work ethic is as good as anyone's but it's kind of like what to me what makes you a great uh commentator too is your ability to analyze and break things down in logical ways and then take that information and do something with it. Um, and so I say all that because you were just kind of breaking down a minute ago a, a bunch of things. H has your brain always worked that way where you're able to analyze and put things into, into place? Um, possibly. Like for me, I didn't really see it as a gift. Like, like you're kind of meant, I see it like you're framing it somewhat as like a nice thing, like a good thing. Right. But going through school, it didn't really work good for me <clears> like that. Um, I needed to know steps and like a lot of school was didactic learning, which was read, do the, do the, like in my reading comprehension wasn't high. And so like, I always called myself like, I always had to tell myself, like, I'm not dumb. I'm not dumb. I'm not dumb. Mm. I'm not dumb. I'm, I'm too smart for that. I'm too smart. I'm too smart. Work. Like, I had to always tell myself because it was very difficult for me in school. So growing up, I had a – because I used Hooked on Phonics growing up, and, like, so I already since young had that thing in my head. I didn't learn to read till I was, like, almost in third – like, halfway through second grade. And Hooked on Phonics worked for me. <laughs> it really did. And like uh, taught me to read. But then from that moment on, I don't know if it was a belief that I had or whatever, but it was hard for me to read. Like it was, I remember going through second grade and the teacher like not knowing what to do. And so my mom added that to my curriculum on her own. So I learned to read. And I don't know if that always like stuck with me, but my reading comprehension was low. So going through school, I mean, I just had a really hard time keeping a 3.0. That was the goal. Keep a 3.0 all the way through high school because... You want to go to college and get a scholarship. Excuse me. And so I kind of didn't, I don't know if those steps didn't work well for me in the early parts of my life that we're talking that work well now as an adult. But to me, those are like problem solving abilities. And those aren't very well utilized in school systems. Mm -hmm. Like I have to use that to make a, a, an assessment and then use it. That works really well in life as an adult. But as a kid, you have to follow the lines and stick within the boundaries. And that was really difficult for me, um, the, the school system. So I kind of thought I was like not smart for a long time. Interesting. And then I graduated high school and started coaching uh, wrestling immediately because I didn't get the scholarship because I had to work full time. So, you know, you couldn't go where you couldn't go to college, pay your own way and be on the wrestling team because it took so much time to be on the wrestling team. I couldn't work and go to school. So I had to pick one or the other because I didn't have a scholarship. So with all that, you know, you just kind of, um, I started college for one semester and then decided while I was in this transition point, am I going to work three jobs, go to college and become a firefighter EMT or am I going to just go this other route, which was at the same time I was fighting on the weekends, training during the week, coaching wrestling, 
And those were my jobs, but I like loved them. Like I just loved being in those places more than any of the other stuff I was doing, school and all that I hated. And so I found that um, the school route, which was like the firefighter EMT, the smart route, white picket fence, like the way that is, is logical. That's the way everybody said, go that route. Don't go become a prize fighter. I don't know. It just, it was always so hard for me. It felt so difficult. It felt like going uphill every step because the school was really difficult. So I have so much respect for people who, you know, get through and get their education in college. Of course, like it's hard. Um, but I think it was more just as I grown up and, and moved into my own way of being, I think it's just the type of learning that matters for each type of person. Cause I now know that I excel in so many other areas that a lot of people, even in college, don't. Sure. And so it's like I jumped right into these jobs and I'm doing pretty well and I didn't have a college education. I only have a high school education. And some are like, where'd you go to school? And I didn't, you know. And I think it just has to do with what you're saying. Using my, using analysis and, you know, problem solving skills, articulating them and then using them in real world situations. Um, My mom was always real analytical and she always made me talk through everything growing up and I always hated it and she made me do it you have a great mom I I do you really she's special but when you're growing up it's just fucking annoying (laughs) you just leave me alone I don't want to answer these stupid questions and I get it now because that's how people feel with me sometimes (laughs) as an adult we're all just big kids that have grown up in our traumas yeah I feel like you know and so like having my mom talk me through all these things I think really kind of put me into that frame of mind as well. But my mom, on the other hand, was very good at school. She, you know, college educated, um, learned Spanish in school, extremely smart, like very high IQ, was um, in the, she was a synchronized swimmer, went to nationals, the junior Mm -hmm. Olympic team in synchronized swimming, very athletic, very stubborn and tough and strong. And so I think a ton of my traits of, the stuff you're you're asking me about my intelligence definitely come from my mom for sure. She just she's very smart, very asked a lot of questions and made me talk through everything all the time, whether it's punishment or good decisions, bad decisions. There's always a discussion like we're doing right now. Sit down and fit and talk about it. So from love. Mm-hmm. So um that stuff I think really I think that's part of it. I'm just trying to say that I didn't always look at myself as like a smart person. Like I've had to give myself the grace to understand that there's different areas that I feel smart and different areas that I don't. And it could be the way I'm ingesting the information or it could be because I just don't get it and that's not my thing. But that's why it makes me so much feel more connected with everybody because you see somebody else come into that position that I can't feel and just do it with it with their eyes shut. And it's like, man, is a real truth to we're all supposed to be connected you, using our own gifts where we're supposed to. Like, I can't do everything. And there's a right. reason we're all supposed to work together, I feel like. So even that, like, gives me a, p- a place of grace for people who maybe I'm like, man, they're not so smart. They don't seem real smart. or whatever. It's like maybe they're just in a different intelligence than I am. Like, I could show up really stupid in so many areas. So just all these questions that you're asking me, like all the different – Layouts, no, I haven't always seen myself smart. Yes, the analysis has supported me, but it also has put me in a place where it's given me a lot of grace to where I can say, man, not everybody's smart everywhere and it's built that way. Yeah. No, I mean, I do you see yourself as, as smart now overall? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. really smart. <laughs> just different. Like, because if, if you do an IQ test, some would say I'm dumb, right? You just, there's so many different, um, cause I haven't done one, but I'm saying like, who knows, maybe I flunk it. Sure. I just don't know. Does that make me dumb now? So it's like, who's smart, who's dumb and who drew the line for it. That's the hard part to me. I wonder, you know, cause I, I was the same way in school. I couldn't sit. Well, for me, I couldn't sit in school. I would, it was driving crazy. I didn't like the way, you know, we, we learned. I was, I was miserable sitting in a classroom. Uh, but <clears throat> you know, I look at it now and I wonder if it's just interest. So for instance, for instance, like my experience of you is if you find something you're interested in, you can learn it. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like I'm the same way as well. You know, if I find a subject that I'm really interested in, uh, but 
there's something about that attention and focus that's needed for me to learn. You, good. You, I like how you worded that. I think that's exactly the issue. I, and, I, and you're right. That's what I look up to people who can go to college because I know they're learning things they don't want to learn. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you do this every day? Yeah. Like, How did you just write a 200 page paper about something that you don't care about? And you just told me you don't care about it. Right. How did you do that? Like, it is just no, it's like, there's what's in it. Yeah. I, I don't know. It just, it's tough for me to create from that space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, when you started, like, when did you start, uh, fighting? Like when, or, or when did you know that you wanted to be a fighter? Um, I actually didn't know until I saw like a business opportunity out of it, <laughs> to be honest. What was the business opportunity? The ultimate fighter. Okay. Yeah. Watching that start. And I think, uh, the season that it was Chris Lieben and Nate Diaz, I don't know what, what season exactly that was, but um, I was fighting over, I had already had a couple pro fights by that time. So I started at that time, you know, I think it's 2006, I started fighting. Um, so, but I wasn't deep into it, you know, at that point, like it was still illegal in every state in the United States. And we were fighting on Indian reservations and co considered human cockfighting. Oh, yeah. Uh, gladiator, weird people. Honestly, like, that's literally the, that was the thing, you know. Um, John McCain said that. And I like John McCain, too. That's, that's crazy. Um, so, like, during that time, there was only 155 pounds and up. So I'm carb loading and putting on weight, eating as much protein as I can and lifting weights mm -hmm. because I don't even, you, you don't know even thinking that there's going to be a 135, 145 pound weight class at this time. Sean Shirk is the champion at 155 pounds and my goal is to beat him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? There's no way I can beat Sean Shirk. <laughs> <laughs> he's so big and he's so fast and he was so good, you know? Yeah. And then that's when BJ Penn and all these guys were still the, the best in their top in the elite killing people and it was so cool rich franklin was fighting anderson silva during this time yeah. chuck liddell era the randy couture when you could still talk nice about him and they still saw his fights like this was then you know i mean well, you can't even see a chuck liddell fight or a, a randy couture fight if you tried anymore <clears throat> nope. gone oh, no. they, they ceased to exist really yeah go look one up i didn't know that you won't find it wow um so i mean that's an olympian that you can't see his fights so it's like this is a time when People don't even know existed. Yeah. And now it's gone because the internet wasn't at its peak like it is now. Social media wasn't at its peak. It was there, but it wasn't at its peak. Like it wasn't working in the fluidity that it is now. So then um, I'm just gaining weight and seeing the ultimate fighter. And I'm like, man, well, at this time, I'm still going to school. And I'm still working three jobs while to pay for my school and to pay for my house. Because I am I moved out on my own when I was 18. So I had to start college right away. And I had to work three part-time jobs to pay for the college and to pay for my rent and to pay for my car payment. Basics, right? Just normal human stuff. But um, I'm fighting on the weekends to get it all out of my system. I was just so pent up, so miserable, so angry. I'd get, I was just working to get the week done and to party on the weekends at that time. You know, mm -hmm. you're 18, 19, 20. Yep. And I'm living like I'm 35 year old dad mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get, trying to have things. I just want to not be paycheck to paycheck anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm just grinding, grinding, grinding. Well, on the weekends, that was my outlet. Like, you're telling me you're going to pay me. All I got to do is drive up to Phoenix. You're going to give me a couple hundred bucks. I just got to get my medicals done and I can just beat somebody to death and nobody's going to arrest me and it's legal because remember, it's still illegal in every state. So it wasn't even a thought that it was going to be what it is today at this time. So it was just an outlet for me and I was having fun with it. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. I just enjoyed getting to beat people up on the weekends instead of doing it in the streets because that's what was happening. I was noticing I was fighting every weekend on the streets after parties and stuff when I was young. I was like, all right, I got to start coaching wrestling. This is getting out of hand. Started coaching wrestling, and then I was in, I, I got in such good shape getting these guys ready that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take a fight on the weekend and see how I do because I was just already wrestling at a high level and staying and running these guys everything. And I kept taking fights on these weekends, random weekends, while I work, while I did all this stuff, and I kept winning. 
And I got to like five and zero oh in the region, and I'd beaten a state champion in that in that region that was in wrestling. And so I was like, wow, I just beat an, a guy in wrestling that was way better than me at wrestling. He was a state champion. I just knocked him out. Mm -hmm. Right? This is weird. I like this sport. Like I can cheat. You know, I can. They might be a good wrestler, but I learned then I was like, I can cheat the whole time, and this is cool. It's like wrestling, but you can cheat. That's what I meant. Like. Wrestling is the first martial art, in my opinion. So getting to do that on the weekend gave me a taste of this, like, freedom and fun and who I was inside. Mm -hmm. But then I'd go to work, go to school, getting ready to be a firefighter EMT, you know, want to get married, have a house, so da 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 That's this other side. And it's like I had to, like, it was weird. It was like they were – one was smart, one was stupid, but they – but one made me way happier than the smart one. Mm -hmm. The dumb, stupid idea, fighting on the weekends, training, uh, wrestling with these guys, and then just working to maintain that lifestyle seems stupid. It's like, that's dumb. It's not even legal. It's not even a thing. But then when the ultimate fighter came, it's like, this is not going to stay little and stupid. Mm -hmm. I could see that there's no way this doesn't take off. I just, I just knew it. It's boxing took off. Why wouldn't this? Right. It's just simple. I just knew it. I didn't have any doubt in my mind once I saw the Ultimate Fighter that that sport was going to explode. And so I was literally at a time where it's like I could go and just start gaining weight and try to fight Sean Shirt. Or I could continue going to school and being miserable. <laughs> and I was like, eh, I'm young enough. Packed all my shit up and went to San Diego. Well, I took a fight. I took my sixth fight. This was it, actually. In, I was getting ready to fight in Colorado. I said, I got to 5-0 and on my own in the region. And I said, okay, if I'm going to take this serious and quit going to school and doing all this, I need to win this next fight, and I'm going to leave my region, and then that will get me somebody who cares about me, who will coach me, who will manage me. Because at this point, I have some friends that would come around, and they would, like, hold pads for me and gather us, and then, like, a guy who would help me lift, and, like, you get a guy who would be like, okay, today I can hold for you, but, you know, you couldn't get pad holders. You, I didn't have a coach because I'm 5-0. I'm mm -hmm. doing it on the weekends. I'm not, like, committed, but I'm also not. Like you said, he doesn't look very good. So you said it yourself. So all that being said, that's that was the general vibe about me. And so I knew that that wasn't true, obviously. But I needed to get out of the region to prove it because mm -hmm. nobody in the region gave a shit mm. and was going to support me or help me or coach me or give me a free – you had to pay $65 for pads. Nobody's going to hold for you for free. So how did I get pad work? Oh, my gosh. Like, that's where this sport is. People don't understand. Like, all these guys coming in and just getting, like, no. You have to pay for pad work. Yeah. Somebody's doing work. They don't care about me. Yeah. I'm a janitor. I'm cleaning the mats and the toilets right now. Like, right. Seriously. And then working three jobs when I'm done. And I'm cleaning and janitoring so that I can pay my membership because I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, this is where... The sport was when I started it. Now it's like, if you don't hold pads for me, then you don't care about me. Like, what? Yeah. Like, go hit a bag. Pad entitlement. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, anyways, I look at this and it's like crazy how big the sport has gotten. That's how fast it exploded. But I knew if I got out of the region, I'd be set. So I went to, um, I I set up a fight in Colorado at 155 pounds against a, a champion in the organization. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was King of the Cage, actually, in Colorado. And I can't remember the guy's name, but the whole event gets canned. Not just our fight. The whole event gets canned two weeks before the fight. And I was, like, training with Drew Fickett at this time, and we had a whole group of guys. And at this time, if you can get a group of guys to all be training for fights at the same time, it was a gift because mm -hmm. you had training partners – that were good. Mm -hmm. They weren't just like off their lunch break trying to fuck you up. And you got to, I used to have to have like line up six guys to beat me up because they weren't in shape and they weren't sure. good and they didn't know what they were doing, but six of them are hard to beat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I had to do that instead of having like, now I've got a team of guys that one guy's enough. Like I can train with one guy. He's good. So when I was training with Drew Fick in this squad, we called ourselves team scrub. Uh, thanks Drew. Um, I was prepared and he's and, and I and I was gonna go to Colorado and fight this fight. And when it got canned, I went to Drew and I'll never forget this was a huge point in my life. 
one of the biggest. Drew Fickett. I mean, he's got he's just he's got fights in the UFC for those of you who don't know. Beat Josh Koscheck. He's just he's a crazy dude, but awesome. Was it was an awesome guy, has a big heart. And uh I said, Hey, I can't. This fight got canceled, but I got a fight on two days' notice that um I got a call that I can go to uh, San Diego and fight in um Total Combat, it's called which was Eric Del Fierro's organization at the time with Diana. They owned it together. And they called, I got on the phone with Eric and he's like, yeah, not going to lie. The guy's good. He's not a chump. It's the co-main event. You'd be saving the show. It's at 145 pounds, 145. That didn't even exist. So I'm like, I was fighting at 155 (laughs) at altitude. So you're going to give me a fight at 45 at sea level. I'm good. Yeah. Like I can, and it was only three rounds, not five. So I'm like, wow, this like it work out. Perfect. Yeah. Like I'm in shape for five rounds at altitude. And this is three rounds at sea level. Yeah. I'm in shape. Even if this guy is good, I'll gas him out mm-hmm. is what I was thinking. doesn't even matter. I'll just gas him out. And so I said, I got off the phone and well, I said yes. And I got off the phone and I was just nervous. So I was like, ah. Oh. I had just ordered lunch and I remember I gave away my lunch. I was like, all right, you guys can have my lunch. And I was working at Sherwin Williams at the time. So loading paint in the truck, I was a paint delivery driver. And I told all my guys, I was like, dude, I got a fight next weekend. And they're like, what? And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to California and get this fight. So I got, I got my days off. My boss gave it to me. He's like, good luck. And I left. I left my regular job and went. And I showed up. Um, I went to Eric or to, to Drew the next day after I said yes to the fight. And I was like, man, can you come with me to the fight? I took a fight on two days notice. I'm ready. To, he's like, ask me the logistics. He says, oh, yeah, you're ready. It's three rounds, and you've been ready for five rounds, and you've been training hard. You're, you're ready. And I'm like, okay, so you can come with me. He's like, do you have money to pay for my flight? And I said, no. And he's like, will they pay for my flight? He's like, no. He's like, yeah, you don't need me. You're good. Just looked at me, and he's like, you're fine, man. Just go. You're good. And I looked at him, and I was like, I don't know. He was so serious and didn't flinch and didn't. And he was a UFC fighter that had won at the highest level multiple times, not once. Like he was good. And I, he just strangled everybody out on our team all the time. So you respect him, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, if he says I'm good, I'm good. And I believed him. Ignorance is bliss. Uh Wasn't good. Went, left, showed up. um, And Eric loved me because I didn't, there was no, I, he didn't have to pay for a cornerman and I was on two days notice and he had all that stuff he had to pay for before. So he ended up saving money on me. <laughs> oh, the fight game. Yeah. And flying me in by myself. And I'll never forget a guy named RJ picked me up and he's like, all right, just you, man, you got no one with you. And I'm like, no, he's like, you're fucking crazy. You came by yourself. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. And <laughs> We're, <laughs> we're getting in the car. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm good in my head. But now I'm like, you start right. guessing, you start second guessing yourself. I've heard the story. Because everybody's so shocked that you start, I started second guessing myself yeah. a little bit, you know, tiny bit. But at the same time, I'm from Arizona at this time. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I, at this time, like, they don't know who I am or what I've been through. Like, it's all good. They just don't know. And they don't know Drew. And like, you just make all these weird stories up that <laughs> make it why you're going to win, even though none of them are true. Right. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm still cutting weight because remember, I was gaining weight for 155. Mm. So I had to lose about uh, 20 pounds in two days. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I did it. And so I'm dying of starvation and thirsty as shit, right? And we go weigh in at Hooters. And we get them weighing in, and I ordered 50 hot wings, <laughs> and I ate the whole oh, plate no. <laughs> and, a thing, and a pitcher of water. And he watched me do it, and he's like, I've never seen anybody do that in my life. <laughs> I swear to God. He's like, you're disgusting. <laughs> and he just, this guy just met me. And I just remember, like, he's putting all these weird thoughts in my head, like, I don't know I'm doing stupid shit. <laughs> I'm 5-0. and oh. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like. Right. And the sport's not big. There's no, there's no slate. There's right. no wrong or right way to do anything. People like everybody at home, you're hearing this now going, what an idiot. I don't know then. Yeah. Nobody knows that there's a right and a wrong way. Like you just get it done. Right. Right. You just, you're hungry. You eat, you got to lose weight. You lose the weight. There's not like a, 
well, I need to go see a rocket scientist and figure out how much weight I can lose at a time. You just right. do it. So I'm just at that point doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. And I'm here because what else do I have? And I don't give a fuck. Fuck all of you. None of you are here for me. I already know because you're from California. You're here putting me against a hometown favorite. So I came in already like I don't give a fuck what anybody says or thinks about me. I already know you brought me here to lose. No question. I'm here to lose. Yeah. I already knew. So I was already kind of just water off a duck's back type of thing yeah. by myself. <laughs> like, fuck it. And, <laughs> and I go and we're getting ready. And the commission comes in and he goes, who's your corner? I go, I don't have one. They're like, you have to have cornermen. So they went and got like a guy that just two random people that I'd never met before and they put him in my corner and one guy started holding pads for me he was holding pads in the bag for another guy so i'm like yeah just i throw i had to tell him like what i he's like what do you do do you kick do you punch <laughs> i'm like i just just give me some boxing and i'll warm up and like we did it i warmed up wrestled the shit out of somebody because at this point i'm mostly wrestling did you ever see these guys afterwards i never had life? pad work by the way remember i can't afford pad work so this is the first real you get a little pad work here and there when people will be nice enough to give it to you. Yeah. But I don't really have a lot of pad yeah, work. So this is a gift. I'm already happy. Did you see these guys afterwards, by the way? Like, did you? Oh, yeah. Okay. We have a relationship afterwards okay. and it doesn't go pretty. Okay. They, they all become scumbags. <laughs> That's in a the whole end. other story. That's what's even crazier is the two, the guys that were there at the beginning end up being some of the slimiest meatballs in my life oh, as man. I come up in California. Oh, man. Crazy. And uh, I won't even say their names. That's why I won't say their names because mm -hmm. jerks. Not bad people, just mean decisions, mm. you know? Uh, so long story short, I go out there and I fucking win on a split decision. Oh. Broke my nose for the first time in that fight. And it was like completely shattered. It, that one hurt. And I broke all the, I broke a couple of ribs mm. on his side. His name is Dave Hiscierto. And yeah, it was a war. He dropped me. Once or twice, I dropped him. It was back and forth. And uh, he had just beaten a guy named Crazy Horse right before I fought mm -hmm. him. That's what he was known for, triangling Crazy Horse. Mm -hmm. And if you know Crazy Horse, that was a big deal. So for me to beat this guy was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Not just for me to prove to myself that this is some, I'm not a, I'm, I am good. I can do this. I'm, I could be high level at this. But it was also just big because um, I'm out of the region. Mm hmm finally out of the region. I'm just this nobody from Tucson that got brought in to lose. And I won on a co-main event on the town favorite. I'm six and oh now. Mm -hmm. Now I get done with the fight. My nose is broken. <laughs> and this is the first time I learned, don't blow your nose. Oh, go home, go to the shower, get in the shower, getting ready for the after party because I'm not going to the hospital because I don't have money for that. So I blow my nose in the shower and both my eyes complete, go completely shut. All the blood shoots mm. into my eyes and I go blind in the shower. Ah, I like freak <laughs> out. I grab the side. I knock the shower curtain down. I fall out of the shower. I'm like freaking out because you're going from regular to completely blind and you don't know why. And all wow. you did is blow your yeah. nose. But it's not blind. You're just your eye. You kind of see. No, you're blind because it filled. Oh, yeah. it, it swelled all my. It just shut them like this. I've it's seen swelling. That yeah, it was disgusting. And then I just calmed down for a minute and then gathered it and figured it out. Walked across the street to the. Uh, we had the after party was at a strip club, and I got I I got hammered all night, and that's how I went to the hospital instead of going to the hospital. That's what I did, and I was six and zero. Oh, and he brought me back for the next fight. And then that's when me and Eric met. So it was just like I thought. When I went and fought that fight, I, I met somebody who wanted to manage me. And I met somebody who wanted to coach me and who believed in me. Um, and so that was Eric Del Fierro. But what's so interesting about him is he didn't offer me that right away. He just said, I'm going to bring you back for another fight. You're awesome. And he bonused me. <laughs> so he gave me like 300 extra bucks. I made $1,700 for that fight. Nice. That was good back in the day. Most money I ever made. So I was like, whoa, there's a future, right? <laughs> and so I go back home to Tucson and I go to work on Monday and they made me go home because I was so beat to shit. Couldn't work that day. So I lost like 150 bucks and I needed that 
Mm -hmm. So that was even just another thing I remember, like needing that 150 bucks at work and couldn't work at Sherwin Williams because my face was so battered. Mm. That that was another weird reality check. Like, man, these jobs don't work together. Like, what am I doing? Um, but that started the relationship with Eric, which he brought me back to win two more times. And by the second win in total combat, he said, you need, you haven't showed up with a corner or a manager the last two fights. He's like, do you need one? And I'm like, that would be great. And he said, I'll help you. Can you come to California? And then he uh, booked the Uriah Faber fight for me in the WEC with Reed Harris. Right after I said, yes, I would train with him. Okay. And then I packed all my shit up in Tucson. My, my best friend at the time, I was living in his house, Dylan Van Echo, um, picked me up at the bar at 2 in the morning because I was too blasted drunk to leave. I didn't pack anything. <laughs> I just went to the bar and got hammered. And he packed all my shit up, put my Eclipse on a U-Haul for me, ah. put everything in my, in my car, picked me up when I was blacked out, and then drove me to San Diego. Oh, that's a good friend. Great friend. Wow. Best best friend. I'd still talk to him today. Love that guy. Um, and he's like, I know it's hard. Because he knew where I was going, man. Like It wasn't going well for me, the it's, decisions I was making. You know, hearing, hearing your story up to this point, um, I'm trying to figure out how, how to talk about it because I've seen it so much with fight. It's a fighter thing. It's It's hard for people that aren't in – the fight business to understand where you were at in that mentality, like kind of do whatever it takes. We'll you will sleep on a couch, you know, you'll sleep wherever you can. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, even the mentality of going to California without a coach, you're like, fuck it. Like I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to have nothing. Guy. Yeah. You're, and you're, it's just a fight. And it's and me and him anyway. War. And that's yeah. the whole thing that the, the wars in the smaller shows, I mean, they're memorable because you, you know, I mean, you can always feel it even, you know, but it's a different type. Emotional of to think back about it, to be honest. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It was a lot. I mean, you're fighting I, for I, life. Well, even sitting here talking about it, uh, you don't realize like how much of it you skip over because of how much traumatizing it actually really was. Like you kind of just yeah. keep going, you know, like, oh, uh-huh. we did that. yeah, we did that. And <laughs> everybody did that. Right. You know? But what was it like? I mean, okay, so you're, you're, you know, you have this corner guy that you, you know, you don't really know these guys at all, but at least they're there to kind of help you. Mm-hmm. So you have somebody. That's a little relief. It was, yeah, it was great. It's a little relief. Well, I had nobody before. Yeah. For five fights. So I'd have like a guy, but he would work. He had jobs and made money and, you know, like he was friendly and he would help me. His name was Rocco, but in the end, that guy, like, Ended up, everything was a lie too. You know, a lot of what he was showing up as. It was just everything around me was just not, it was just me surviving. Yeah, so you you go into this fight, uh, got two corner guys you don't really know, but at least you got somebody. And you know this guy beat Crazy Horse. To you, it's a giant opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. Yeah, it's like- It's the biggest one I was going to get. Yeah, so you know this. You're Mm -hmm. like- Screw it. I'll go here without a corner. I don't care. I'm going to fight this guy. Mm-hmm. I know I'm in better shape. Here's my game plan. I'm going to gas this guy out. Mm-hmm. Uh, going into that first round, what, I mean, you said it was a war. I, I haven't seen uh, watched the fight. What was what was the... Can't find that fight anywhere. Uh, what was the combat like? Total Combat uh, did not sell their stuff to the UFC, so those fights are gone. I see. They're just poof in the ether somewhere. So I'll never... I don't know if I'll ever see that fight. Um, but your question was what? What was the what was the, what was the combat like? What was the fight like? Yeah, yeah well, first round. First of all, it's a good point. A lot of people don't know what we went through and stuff. Like you said, the couch and all that. But at the same time, I feel like I don't tell this story a lot because I only hear about only people who went through that. Mm. So it's like a broken record for me. So like for me to say it, it's not like a big deal for me. It's like yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did. I, I'll have twenty people that did the same thing in front of me, around me every day. Yeah. Those are all that we're all the same. So I'm talking to you about it. Like it's, I mean, it's not, I don't talk about it because it's so not something you talk about because they all went through it. Why would I talk about it? Yeah. But when I talk to you about it, it almost, I feel like I shouldn't. <laughs> right. It's weird. It's like, I feel like a guilt to talk about it. Like I went through that and like, it didn't happen to me. 
It happened so much for me at this point that I feel weird saying it like it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't bad. It sounds bad when I say it, though. It wasn't bad, but it's it's hard for people to understand the emotion. There's a lot of emotion, Mm -hmm. pain, over, I mean, it's good. You overcame adversity. You beat this guy that you weren't supposed to beat, but there's a lot that goes into that people don't understand that fighters go through. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to kind of get at. Okay. That day uh, was, was just terrifying. Because um, I just know I'm there to lose and I don't know anybody. So going back into it, um, I think what helped me the most was having nothing. Yeah, just like I'm 5-0, and which is nothing. Um, I'm working three jobs. I'm coaching wrestling. My family has no history of money. And if I needed, if I had an emergency right now, nobody could spot me or support me like to get me through a rough time or my mom or my brother, or if anybody that I loved more than myself got hurt, I and nobody else would support them either. So it's like, what, why not go at that point? It's like, I, things have to, things have to be different. They just can't, I can't keep going paycheck to paycheck and watching my mom and my grandma go paycheck to paycheck their whole life and never get a break Mm -hmm. ever like that. No way. So stuff like that goes into your head, I guess I'm stronger. I'm faster. I'm in better shape and I want it more. I had a that was my mantra. Uh, I would say that thousands and thousands and thousands of time and just take that big deep breath that you just heard me take. Mm Mm-hmm. Stronger, I'm faster, I'm in better shape, and I want it more. Mm. And those things would usually be enough until you get to that guy that's the same. Yeah. And then, uh, so you went through it. You broke your nose for the first time. You had a war. Uh, in the middle of a fight, were you, what were you thinking? Were you in, like, uh, survival? Were you focused? What was, what was that like? I was shocked how in shape he was <laughs> it's horrible <laughs> it's a bad feeling when you figure it yeah, out yeah i too. was like god you're in shape like me yeah like you're in just as good a shape and i did not expect this yeah. it's horrible and you're not going away yeah. he's a mean tough mexican just like me horrible yeah it was a mirror match and i didn't know it and it turned out he was a 35 year old prison guard that ran the prison guards. He was the leader of all the prison oh, guards wow. at, at the local prison, I found out later. So all he did was get them in shape. He was the guy that got the prison guards in shape, that bastard. <laughs> He's a gazelle. I guess he could run forever, and that's why he was submitting. He could. He was obviously a really good black belt mm-hmm. under Charlie Kohler okay. at the time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, his scaredo. He hasn't gotten enough of a shout-out. He definitely kind of turned me into a man that day. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, after you won, what was that? What did that feel like? Nothing. Nothing. Horrible. Why? Because my nose was shattered and I hurt and it wasn't that much. It didn't mean anything really. You just got to go to the strip club that night, I guess, and have some fun. (laughs) But like when you get home, you still got three jobs and you still got to do everything you had to do the day before and nobody gave a shit. Yeah. And it was illegal. So you're actually looked at like a freak. Yeah, it's like, such a why word. did you do that to yourself? Like, what are you doing? Is that really what you want to do? That's what you get when you come home. Yeah. So you're kind of, it wasn't really a big deal. It was just like, for me, it was literally like, ah, oh, I got it out. But it still felt like, you know, you kind of feel like a, like a, what's the word? Um, like a party, you know, you get done partying the night before and then you wake up the next morning. Mm-hmm. What's it called? Party depression or? Post-party depression. <laughs> no, that's postpartum. You're thinking about like <laughs> <pregnant one. laughs> post-party depression. It feels like that. Like when you drink too much and you do a bunch of stupid stuff. Yeah. And then you wake up the next day and you got to live your normal life like a regular adult. Yeah. And you realized you did all this stuff. Because in that, in my context too, remember, it's not like a law-abiding citizen doing these things. Right. You're, you're, you're an idiot. Well, yeah, that's like, like the whole mentality of in the smaller shows, I don't know what it's like now. I've been out for 10 years, but the mentality is you work really hard, uh, you know, training for your fight. You go to your fight. The reward is 500, a thousand bucks. Generally, you know, 500 to show 500 to win, you know, those days. 
And uh, afterwards, everybody goes to the after party. And that's kind of the thing that you always do. That was it. Um, and that was the reward, really. The after party was the reward. <laughs> it was like, yes, 100%. we're at the after party. And you definitely black out. Yeah, there was a lot of that. A bunch of like Neanderthals just <laughs> so happy to be drunk <laughs> that we got to fight. It's almost like it was like a, I swear it might sound crazy, but it's like you, I felt like I beat the system. Yeah. In a weird way. How did you beat it? Well, because I got paid to fuck somebody oh, up. Gotcha. Yeah. And you're not putting me in jail. I sense. was doing that already. Yeah. And I was scared every time I had to run. Yeah. Doing dumb things. Like, I'm not running around doing it often, but you're doing dumb ratchet stuff. Yeah. I guess you'd say when you're 18, 19, yeah. you're just not making smart decisions. Absolutely. I wasn't horrible, but I wasn't smart. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was just looking to Overall test myself. good, and then you'd, you'd mess up every now and then. Testing myself is how I see it. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> Testing. So uh, after after that fight, uh, I guess you had another fight, but then you went to the WEC mm -hmm. and fought Faber. And that's when – that was the first fight in WEC. What was that like going to that – let's call it the, the big show because it was the big show at the time for that weight class. What was that like? Well, I had won two titles at that point in total combat. I won the 145-pound title, the 155-pound title. And I was 9-0. and So I felt good. I was confident. And then I went into that fight. And that was the first time I'd had cameras on me and, like, been to a big show where it's like, well, first of all, I just explained to you how ratchet, little, illegal, and stupid fighting was. Now there's a camera on me, and this is a televised thing on Versus Network. So it became no longer the comfort zone of fighting in the streets mm -hmm. type of feel like getting away with one. Now it became like, Oh shit. Like a responsibility all of a sudden, like a weird responsibility. I was in Vegas for the first time. I uh, had just, I turned 21 years old on the ninth and the fight was March 7th. So I was 20 years old fighting in Vegas and I'll never forget I was with a, um, my manager at the time named Matt Stansel. I remember Matt. Yeah. Good guy. Yeah. Had a separation because, you know, work wasn't getting done or whatever, but loved that man. Did a, life, did a lot for me. Took me to a dinner with a friend he had, and I'll never forget, like, this was the manager taking me to a dinner. It was weird. <laughs> Just that. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have a manager, so I'm 9-0. and I'm on a big show. I've got a manager. I'm in Vegas. I'm like, I made it. I'm here. <laughs> and then I get to the dinner and we sit down and it's a steakhouse. And I hadn't been to a steakhouse like that. I mean, maybe one, maybe a couple times, but not really. And not present. You're kind of there because your parents took you there. Right? <laughs> which is whatever. You're not there because you're there, which is where I was at at that point. I'm there and we're here because of me. This is we just made weight. And now we're celebrating the weight make. And that's for me. And so I'm in the middle of the table and we're all around and I'm, I open it and I see the, I'm literally the story of the guy that you see all the forks and the knives and you're like, what the fuck is, why are there two cups? Like, why is there all these knives and forks? No clue what I'm doing here. I think it was nine. It was at the ghost bar at a steakhouse at the ghost bar in Las Vegas. I think it was nine, maybe um, something like that. Anyways, very nice. And she orders a lobster. She's like, yeah, we'll take a lobster. And I'm looking, the steaks are $65 to $100 a piece. The sides are $20 a piece. And I'm doing the math according to my life up to that point, which was my mom bought us, had a rule that, you know, you get a value meal, you share the drink, you share the fry, and we each get our own meals because they're two ninety nine cent bur three ninety two ninety nine cent burgers with a value meal, and we share this, the soda and the fries. I mean, my whole life, that was just what you do. You don't order your own separate meals. You never need it. You don't need it. Um, and then stuff like uh, shoes were $65, and you got one pair every six months, not more. There's, your, your limit is $65, and you, you each get a pair. So that's $130 for my mom to dish out at that time with no child support. So that's actually a lot. Mm -hmm. So went to pay less, you know, things like that mm -hmm. that uh, – and we're sitting in, I'm sitting here eating a $65 steak and it just doesn't, my brain can't add up that that's a, that's six months of, um, that I'm eating <laughs> in a weird way. Yep. And then the lobster was a hundred dollars. 
and I'll never forget. It was a full lobster and, you know, they break it open, but it was the whole thing on a plate. It was beautiful. I fucking had to leave and I went out and I broke me. Like I started crying and this was the night before the fight. Wow. And I had to call my mom and I had to tell her like, it was crazy. It was like, I'm here. Come to think of it, it was a big deal. Yeah. So. Yeah. What did, like, what did, what did you What did you tell her? What did you feel? I like? just was so happy. Like, it was a hundred. I was telling her how much the lobster was. Mm-hmm. Mistake. And then I said a prayer with her. And then I got to go inside and and I helped me enjoy the meal. Yeah. But. A lot to be grateful for. It was. Oh, man. It was overwhelming. And it was so overwhelming and, like, so fast and, like, too fast. And, and my brain couldn't comprehend why I deserved this now. Yeah. Because what was different? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing was different. Like, I was the same person. I always was. It's just that, what, because I won a couple fights. Now I'm this. And have a hundred dollar lobster, mm-hmm. so uh, it was a reality check for me at the time. I, I guess I never really thought about it that deeply. Like I said, you kind of brush over these things, kind of just go through life, you know. But that was a that really hit me hard. Obviously, like it did right now, I felt very similar, and um, you brought me back to the emotions that I had in that time. It was all the math, doing the math of the money and the my mom and so yeah it's cool that you, you you called her too you know it's like i'm very close to my mom too as you know and uh when you have these experiences for the first time it's great to have someone a, to share a with. mom to share it with yes so yeah but that hit me man and then i had to go to fight the next day don't forget i haven't made it to the fight <laughs> yet yeah so, like, yeah, it did it. I wasn't, like, quite, I was shook, like, with all the fame that it looked like was coming. And then I see Faber, and he's just, like, he's used to it. And he was much old, a little bit older than me, but, like, six or seven years, I think. And we always resisted each other, but I hated how much everybody loved him and how no shot they gave me, and they didn't put my face on the poster, and I was already mad, and I was just. You put your name on the poster. Yeah, so, yeah, they, they didn't put my face on it. Oh, so like they put my name oh, like do. down on the bottom in fine print and then they put his big old face. So I signed like a mustache across his face, <laughs> my, my signature. Oh, that's good. And, uh, they made a rule now. You can't do that. I know it's a prick <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> it was because of you. Yeah. It was a prick thing to do. I get it. But at the same time, it's like a prick thing to not put, I'm fighting a co-main event on this event or, or main event. We were the main event. Yeah. Co-main event. And, uh, you know, like I need my name out there as much as you do. So yeah. Anyways, those little things stood out, but it was a lot. All of that, everything I just said was on my brain. Like sure. Him, where I was at, where he was at, the comparisons, the learning that this is what it's going to look like for the rest of my career. This is the highest level you can get to. So losing that day, I lost by guillotine. I, I felt so good with him until I, I broke the game plan. That wasn't the game plan. What I did was to wrestle because he could grapple and we knew he had a good guillotine. So it was to stay striking and keep him on his feet. And I kind of shot when I got uncomfortable because I'd never felt that level of all that stuff in one moment in that first round. Mm-hmm. And it did, I wasn't, you know, the they say the shell shock or the lights and all. Yeah, that's where when they talk about that in the UFC and they talk about that, like I experienced that on that night. The, the overstimulation of like the show and the lights and the money and the you're special now when you weren't before and the all this stuff like gets you and um got me and um I lost and then he like he like I was in the back and I was bummed and he like well he's like he did that and like smiled at me did this stupid thing and I and I was like I'm gonna kill him like <laughs> I just in that moment, yeah, 
that was it. Like he signed his death wish for, for laughing at me after that. I don't know. It was weird. It's like I knew it though. I wasn't – sometimes you don't know it, but I knew I was going to have a long thing with this guy. It mm-hmm. wasn't going to go away. I wasn't – I was too young, you know? Yep. And he was good. So right then I was like, okay, all I got to do is be able to beat him and nobody will beat me for a long time. Mm-hmm. Easy, easy enough. I was right there. I saw how uncomfortable he was until I wrestled and gave him the win. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's how I molded the confidence to keep going. And I started jiu-jitsu tournaments. Did nothing but jiu-jitsu tournaments for a year after that. Mm-hmm. Nothing but jiu-jitsu with Barrett Yoshida. Oh, nice. Uh, in San Diego. And then that started the, the next 10 years of not, being, not losing after that. I didn't lose again for 10 years after that. Yeah, I mean, I guess that was... 2007, I know you're not good with all the years, but that's uh, after that fight with Uriah, uh, how many fights did you have before you fought for the, the title? I fought Uriah. This is where you need the, com- the computer guy. I fought mm-hmm. Uriah. I fought uh, Charlie Valencia, which was one of his teammates. I fought Ian McCall, which was one of his teammates. Ian McCall, yeah. <clears throat> I fought... Um, Ivan Lopez was a kickbox Southpaw kickboxer. And then I fought Joseph Benavidez. I beat him. Wasn't that for the title? Benavidez? Mm, no. Okay. I was at that fight. That was to get a title shot against Brian Bowles. Bowles was okay. So six fights later, I get a title shot against Brian Bowles in 2010. I see. So six fights mm-hmm. or so, maybe more in the WC. 2010 by this point um i fought yes i fought six fights in a year about a year and a half at this time to then get the title shot against brian bowles who was on a five fight winning streak with five finishes yeah at the time as a title holder he just beat me knocked out miguel torres miguel torres that's the name he was the man back he was all these guys were the man like they are now right and then now we're here and like everybody forgets there was this then too there was these people this level of athlete that everybody was talking about was then too yep so it wasn't just how it is now this was then yep no doubt and people just let go so that's the other thing i know is like all these people that are here doesn't last long no you gotta hold on you gotta appreciate it while you're here because this all these people that are the best now won't be the best in five years. Nobody will even talk about them again. It's just going to be forgotten because you got to promote the next five years. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I mean, there's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of those older names. Uh, Miguel Torres, he was an absolute beast, mm-hmm. man. Absolute beast. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you had all those guys. You fight bowls. You win the title. At what point were you like, okay, now I've now I made it? Well, I quit my job. Okay. That was it. So now I got to quit working. So I was now, I think like, I don't know what my record was, but it took me to get to like at least 13, 14 to know 14 and one before I got to quit my job. So this whole time I'm still working so that I can pay my bills. So I'm, I'm living in a one bedroom studio with this amazing family that let me live back there in a little casita. I got to share their washer and dryer. Oh, that's cool. Amazing family. Is this in yeah. San Diego? Yeah, in San Diego. And um, during that three years where I got all this streak till I won my title, that's where I lived. So I had no bills really. It was 750 a month. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had no car. I ran to the gym every day. So for four years, I ran to the gym and did nothing but teach 19 classes a day for $20 a class. So, or 19 classes a week. Um, and train full time so then i got to quit the job the gym job finally when i won my title in 2010 i said okay you're a title holder now you made the you made a decent paycheck so uh i bought a i bought a honda civic si brand new it was the first brand new car i bought and lived in that that studio for another two years i think and did you did you fight benavides again yeah, I fought him for the title. That was defend the title. Okay, that's yeah. I was so there I fought too. Bowles, and then I fought Benavidez for five rounds mm-hmm. to defend the title against him, and then I fought uh, I don't remember, man, like Jorgensen or Jorgensen was the merger. 
Jorgensen was was the first time the UFC was UFC. And the WC came together. Okay. And I think that's what people don't get. Like, remember how I was saying 155 and up was the only thing that existed. Mm -hmm. Well, all this story that I told you since then was the 135 pound lineage. That's where it started. That's what it sounded like. That's what it looked like. That's what it is. Because I'm the first champion of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's how I had to go through. And thank God for Faber. Because without our rivalry, these divisions wouldn't, maybe might not add as much steam. Right. We hated each other. (laughs) <laughs> like just it's just the timing you know yeah. it really was i mean he's still a dork but i like him <laughs> kind of you know like we're cool i you know i'll tell him that to his face he'll tell me to my face we say the same exact things we always did but just you know beat the shit out of each other it's good we're good yeah <laughs> uh, it's gone like that thing of anger isn't there i'm not annoyed. he doesn't annoy me he just did too much um but yeah that uh, i'm proud to say that you know that lineage really those guys really pushed me to be, I, they made me so mad. They really pushed me to, to be all of them. They made me really good. Yeah. So when you were done with, uh, when you, you had the merger with the UFC, what was it? Was there, a, was there a change? Did it feel different when it was the UFC from WEC? No. It felt the same. The competition was the same. Sure. So that's what other people don't get. It's like, oh, now you're in the real big leagues. No, yeah, no. Like, I, w- I was always, always started it. Yeah. And never changed. None of the opponents changed. I knew who was the best. I was already fighting the best in the WEC. And then it was so reliable to say that, that the, every WEC champion became UFC champion that year. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Or every WEC, oh, every, oh. Every champion in the WEC came over and became, and, and won, like was able to win that UFC title. Like I Benson see. Henderson at 155 pounds. Oh, I see, I forgot that it was, I was just thinking 135. Because there was other weight classes yeah, yeah. in the WEC. I see what you're saying. You had saying. Cowboy yeah. Cerrone, you had Benson Henderson, yeah. you had Chael Sonnen, you had um, all these other yeah, weight I classes, forgot. all the way to 205. Yep. Uh, Brian Stan. Yeah. So Brian Stan was a champion in the WEC. Beat the Rhino. Remember the Rhino? The right, what, was, what was Rhino's name? No, the he's just a, just a random guy that Brian Stan beat to win the title. And then Chael Sonnen uh, smashed somebody too. And like, I don't know, these are the guys that were there and they all crossed over and became champion of the UFC. Even though those weight classes, even though those weight classes existed in the UFC, they came and beat them. That's how good the WEC was. Interesting. So it's like, uh, it was the UFC. It was the same thing. Yeah. It was just that no one knew because the UFC's name value is so perfect. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there were some killers that came from WEC, obviously, they, 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 yeah, yeah, they came over and won the titles. I didn't, it was awesome. I didn't remember that. I was something I was. We were all really proud of, yeah. to be honest. Like I remember talking to other channels, Showtime, Anthony Pettis, all these guys. Like when we crossed over, like man, yeah, like we always because you all you get asked until you get to the UFC, like you got to these guys guy. who cross over. Yeah. All you get asked is when are you going to be there? Yeah, and even though you know you're facing the best guys in the world in PFL, Bellator. Yeah. The only thing they're going to ask you when you're champion there is when you're going to be champion in the UFC. Yeah. And they all know, and they're tired of hearing it too. Yeah. They hate it. And I get that because I felt it too. I was in the WEC and everybody wanted to know when I was going to be in the UFC. And they didn't even have my weight class. So imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because, you know, same thing with Strike Force, same thing with Bellator. Mm-hmm. It's always compared to the UFC. And, People always wonder if you're going to go to the UFC or if you could be the the guy, the best guys in the UFC. And you're like, yeah. Well, it's, you got to, I mean, it's no different in a lot of other sports. That's why I don't mind mentioning it. Look sure. at NFL football. Yeah. Like any football league you're in, that's not the NFL. Nobody cares. Right. You just don't care. You could say you're the best indoor league champion league on earth. Nobody cares until you're in the NFL. I mean, I guess so, people sort of care. I mean, like Bellator is pretty impressive. Strike force is pretty impressive. WEC is pretty impressive, but it's not probably to the at to, to the to the everyday fan. It probably isn't. So I'm using strong words. I care. I think the masses do care. Yes. The reason I say don't care is because the only question you're going to get is when are you going to be in the UFC? Right. Yeah. That's what I mean by don't care. Yeah. So you care to us, you know, to yeah. an extent up against. Well, that's sweet. That's cool, yeah. But 
And anytime you hear that, but it's not enough. Yeah. So yeah, no one cares. That's, That's what I mean. I get what you're saying. <laughs> um, you know, so for you, you, it merged the UFC, um, and you're, at what point did you fight Faber again? The first time. I don't remember the year. I think uh, 2007 and then 2012, I think. Yeah, so, so you beat him, and then it's clear that you're the I best. I beat him to, to keep the title. Yeah. And to defend it. I had beaten it with Jorgensen. That was, that was with the UFC, though, right? So I was in the WEC, in the, and we fought in Phoenix, Arizona. Benson Henderson got the title that night, and I got the title that night in Arizona. Cool. And then... My next fight was Faber in the UFC rematch against Faber. Okay. And, you know, after that, I, re I remember it was, it was clear. It was like, okay, no question. Cause before it was like, well, but can he beat Faber? Yeah. You know, can he beat Faber? And Faber was, cause I was the guy that beat me. It was the only loss Faber. I had. So I had to revenge my only loss yeah. to become champion. And then you beat Faber decisively. Um, Which I don't think people understand. Like he had beaten me and it was hard. So like to all that years, all that him looking at me, all that, that was from 2007 to 2012. Mm -hmm. So five years I had been thinking about beating that guy and I'd beaten all his teammates. He'd thrown all his teammates mm -hmm. at me to beat me. Yeah. I finally got there. So to win that was just like, that, was that bigger to you than big the, deal. the title? Did it feel, feel bigger? He, to beat him? Yes. It, yeah. Well, yes. It just. Uh, it was cause like my old mentality with that was, you got to remember he was like that whole team. Like I said, how important it is to have people to train with. Mm -hmm. I had to build my own guys and bring people in. He had a team that worked together in my mind and I had to face all of them that worked together. Mm -hmm. So I felt like why join him if I can beat him? I want to beat the whole, all of you guys. And so it felt good to say that I had beaten him, mm -hmm. the leader of all the people I'd beaten to get to him. And then beating him at the top. Like, it was the way it happened. Because I knew he was trying to, he had been sending other teammates to fight. Oh, yeah. Joseph Benavidez twice. Ryan Bowles trained with him. Ian McCall trained with him. Charlie Valencia trained with him. We're talking shit the whole time, too. All the whole time. <laughs> and so that whole time, all these guys cross-training with him. I'm the guy that no one likes. Yeah. Right? In that time. The bad guy or whatever you want to say. You beat them all, though. And I, yeah, until I, until you don't. Yeah. That's the his. That's what war is. Yeah, it then, goes. It goes and goes and goes until it doesn't. Yeah, I'm reminiscing about, you know, I'm remembering what that was like, uh, at least uh, from my perspective. And it was a big deal. It was. It seemed like a bigger deal when you beat Uriah, uh, because it was like no question, Dom's the best. You know, there was always it was that. then. Yeah, in 2012. Yeah, I was pound for pound. Yeah, number two, I believe. Yeah. The only person, oh, I had fought Demetrius Johnson in the middle of that too. Yeah. And at that time, I was ranked number two pound for pound behind Demetrius Johnson, who I had beaten. And Demetrius is one of the greatest of all time. No question. Mm -hmm. One of the toughest fights, one of the tougher fights I had made me make some real adjustments, mm -hmm. crazy adjustments. So nothing but kudos to, to these guys, incredible athletes. Demetrius still winning, still fresh, still yeah. nasty today. Still, like, so proud that I got to fight him and have, you know, a, a, a good fight with him. He's a good human. Like, so that's mixed into there, too. I, I beat, beat Mighty Mouse. And then, um, you know, around the time that I beat Faber, I think I defended my title after Faber against Mighty Mouse one month or two months later. Okay. And that's where I got my GTR because I, they wanted me to make a quick turnaround defend my title after i beat faber i knew they asked me to defend my title right away against demetrius johnson and they'd give me a gtr if i did it right away on the next show what's gtr uh nissan skyline gtr my car oh the car i see yeah they gave me my car one of my like that was the dream car i always wanted that's awesome so i was like so they gave me the purse and then they gave me that car and i was like okay i'll do it okay and then i turned around and made a really quick turnaround and fought in a main event on versus, which wasn't going to get a lot of eyes and I wasn't going to get pay-per-view money. Mm. So that's why I got the car. I see. So that was the, the way to make it even because it wasn't a big network. At what point, you know, you're champion and then you get injured. Well, I beat Demetrius and then I, 
I'm uh, getting, and then I think after that I get injured. I think getting ready. Oh, the Ultimate Fighter. For the third, for the trilogy. Mm-hmm. The book after I beat Demetrius. Uh, I've defended the title successfully twice now. I cleaned out the division at that time because I'd beaten everybody before I got there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd beaten the, all the top five in the division. And so we put me on the ultimate fighter against Faber. And then it was the first and only show they did live. So it was three months long. Oh, wow. So I had to coach and train myself for the fight simultaneously. So it was, that's why they never did it again. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not too easy. It was super hard, super hard. So I would have to do two a days and then train them twice a day on TV. It was brutal. And I was, I was in sick shape, though. I was in super good shape. I was going to kill him. So sad I didn't make it to that fight. I was so ready. But just so much. My life at this time wasn't working outside of fighting. Fighting was the only thing working. Yeah. Life was in shambles. It was a mess. Just had no life skills to deal with all the things that I was allowed to have now that I had things. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't have skills to deal with it. I mean, you know... You don't have the skills to deal with it, and then you get injured. Uh, and yeah. Well, I got injured because I didn't have the skills to deal with it. That's the responsible version of the conversation Okay, for me. Well, so you get injured, mm-hmm. and uh, you get injured, you get injured. You get injured multiple times every time you go to come back, basically. What was the first injury that you got in that period? My hands. I fought all my titles with broken hands, pretty much. Like they were just shattered. I had 10 hand surgeries in that span before I even hurt my knees. Um, I tore the ligaments that it's called the extensor tendon ligament on both my middle knuckles here. Um, and they slice it and they take this uh, tendon that we all have that we don't need anymore. And they took a chunk of that and they replaced that tendon right there, mm-hmm. sewed it together. So now this tendon is twice as thick in my middle knuckle as my other one. So that'll never shatter again. <laughs> It'll never break. It'll never sever again. And that's the one that lifts your finger. So you can see how this hand kind of stays a little bit up yeah, compared to this one because this surgery failed, so they had to do it twice. Oh, man. This one only once, and that's how good it, they did. What an amazing surgery they did on this one. He took out the tendon here, and he looped it around and got it to got the extensor tendon to stay so he didn't have to pull a graph out on this oh, side. Nice. Tried to do it on this one. And it failed, so then he had to do the graft. So that ended up taking adding another three surgeries, two surgeries. And then I went back to training too soon, and I was sparring with one hand, and I had just gotten the stitches. And so I just wrapped it up and put a boxing glove on oh, it with no. a cast. I, I had the cast on still. I, <laughs> and I just put a boxing glove on it, and then I was just boxing. I was kickboxing, live sparring with one hand and thought the glove would, like, and somebody threw a high kick on me like they weren't supposed to because I was beating their ass and they got mad and threw a high kick and I blocked oh, it. Oh, no. Exploded my hand, had to go back into surgery. So that took another surgery. So like a lot of dumb things by just not surrendering to the outcome that things were. Sure. But you, um, you said you had around 10 surgeries on your hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... We'll say seven to go we'll low. We'll say seven surgeries on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> and then you blew your knee out. Was that that's what happened uh, for the the the, the ultimate arrival. fighter, the live one? I I blew my ACL MCL, ACL MCL. Yeah, those two tendons. Yeah, I, I blew it on the show. That still hurts my heart. Yeah, there's a lot of money on the table. That was going to be my big payday. I was going to get pay per view buys on the Chael Sun and Anderson Silva fight. Oh man, I was going to get pay per view money on that, and I pulled out because I couldn't even walk. Yeah, of course. Well, um, so after. You you blew your knee. You had surgery. Um, Some people say, look, I want to go back to that. Some people say, like, maybe I should have fought and not given the show up, right? But it's like, I can't even put a show on for what? Oh, yeah. Just to get smashed in a round? Well, What's, I mean, what would be the point of that? The reason I moved on, but it's it's just because I know you. I'm like, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> like, you want to win. Yeah, I just don't get the – I can't eat my brain – I'll go ahead and give a little space and say, okay, maybe I could have been in a hard spot 
and somebody was dying in my family and I needed the money. But I don't know. I still might have just said, look, mm -hmm. we're going to figure this out. I'm going to come back and get the money when I'm healthy. Yeah. It's not, it, do, it doesn't show integrity to me to, to go in there hurt like that where I can't even walk. Right. If I could do something, yes. Like I fought with broken hands because I could do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could shoot them with cortisone and then you don't feel them and now you can fight. But a knee, it was like walking on glass. Well, I guess in, integrity for you is to not go out there just to collect a paycheck. It's to go out there and put on a show. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I mean. Well, that's what you're paying me for. You're not paying me to go flop. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's what I mean by integrity. So it's like, yeah, I could have been the tough guy and gone out there and sh saved the show. That's a hypothetical thing too, where it was weak to pull out, right? Some would say, but I mean. That would hurt your legacy though, man. It really I mean, would see that, that's making it about me. But even at that moment, I'm like, dude, I still have two, I still have another month and a half left teaching these guys. Plus I'm doing a live show. I can't do that with a blown ACL. So it was like, totally different circumstance but i look back on it and it was a very 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 hard miserable time mm. to have to pull out of that yeah that was horrible it still bothers you i hate it <laughs> yeah i it can imagine just, i mean it's millions of dollars probably. it's not even that even it's, uh, it's just, a, just it's like opportunity it's such a um yeah opportunity and it's just such a letdown of the or of to dana the organization like it's you people are counting on you yeah. to make it it's like you're oh you know how many times i had to call dana and tell him i was hurt oh. and he just goes you have to you know one of the times we had i called him like blew my knee out man i gotta pull out for the ultimate fighter he goes you've got to be the most unlucky person i've ever met in my entire life and knowing dana now that's funny because he's <laughs> such a gambler <laughs> <laughs> like no no i'm like that's hilarious because at the time i go dana what am I supposed to do with that information that you just gave me? <laughs> you would ask him that. I said that. <laughs> and he just goes, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I know. So what do I do? Like, what do you want me to do? I'm hurt. And he's like, all right, well, and he told me what we were going to do. They made the, the interim champion. And then Baral fought Faber. And then Faber lost to Baral, got beat to death by Baral. And then Baral fought Dillshaw. And then I had to, during that entire time, mind you, I get to commentate about how great all these guys are while I'm on mending my blown out knee. Mm -hmm. So that was difficult too. But that's also the blessing that it became. It gave me, it gave me something that I love. I love I'm do, I've been doing commentary for 11 years now because of that. Yeah, and you were out though because you, you lost the title because you kept getting injured. Well, I lost the title because I blew my knee out two times in a row. Yeah. So I did six months and I was on my way back. And then I blew it out again, and they're like, okay, we got to strip you. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. I'm aligned. Like, oh, let's go. What's that like? You know, the, the, the Well, that's the what mental. I'm ashamed of. That's what was so hard. That's why I'm like, oh, I hate it. Because you're having the talks with the business owners, mm -hmm. and they're disappointed in you. Well, I understand that, but like the mental struggle, because that's business part. There's also the part where you're at home, you know, probably by yourself. Uh fighting depression i don't know you know like specifically but like there's got there's a lot of demons that come with injuries and long waits like that and a spotlight of being a world champion um what was that like mm. well like i said it was miserable because i had had a girlfriend that was like real we were i was in a real toxic relationship at that time in and out in and out just a lot of drama and so that wasn't there for me when you know, surprisingly, and I didn't create the space to allow them to be there. I wasn't the type of human to have an environment where I would let you come be there for me when I'm in the lowest points of my life. I shut everybody out and then act like I can handle it while I fall into a little puddle of nothingness. That's where I was at. I didn't know how to be vulnerable. I didn't know how to ask I didn't, you know, and when I would be vulnerable, it was so scary because it was over the top. It wasn't like a calculated, I'm doing this because I need to. It was like, I'm out of control, vulnerable. Lost it. I've lost everything. So I think it was just heavy to be around me at that time. It was, I feel for anybody who had to be around me at that time. I'm sorry, friends. Uh, it was really hard. I was really hard on myself. I was really hard on the people around me. And it was, it was, it was dark. 
Yeah. I there was even a it was it was um I fought it. I fought the first one, fought it. I'm gonna be back faster. And then you blow it out again. That's when you hit that's when it hits. And then I was good actually. I make it another six months before they strip me, mind you. So the UFC stuck with mm-hmm. me, and that's why I love I have a lot of respect, honestly. And I mean, because they they kept they kept with me. They, we were trying to make it work. I hadn't lost, you know, so it was hard to just throw me out. But then blow, blowing it out twice, and then I blow my quad out getting ready for Burrow. That's mm. what it was. I was getting ready for Burrow, and then I tore the quad off my bone. And that was a three-month injury to to let it reconnect, shoot stem cells, and or shoot. I had to do PRP in that. They're stabbing the shit out of it. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. So, like, that took three months, and then that's when I kind of, like, let go of control. I was like, okay, dude, you may never come back. I blew my knee out twice, and then I blow my quad out from throwing kicks while I'm getting ready for a title fight against mm-hmm. Burrow. Then they take that fight away, and they strip the title, and then I'm like, okay, this is it. You've just been injured so much, you might never come back. Yeah. And that's where everything started to work because I surrendered. That's where I learned about surrender, that I was trying to control the outcome. I was trying to control the injury. I wasn't accepting what is, which is you're hurt, and you may never do this again. Like, I was not accepting that. I was going, there's no way. I'll work through it. I'm too strong. I'm too. It, like, there was just no level of – let go Mm -hmm. it was just only control i'll get through a control 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 that's not what the injury was there to teach me and i wasn't receiving what it was there to teach me so then when i blow the quad out and they strip my title i finally surrender and give up Mm -hmm. that's when i'm like okay i lost everything they took the title like i've been hurt so much i lose faith too that i'll be okay like my body just doesn't want to do this anymore and so I, I said, you need to find another way to live this life. Like, you love this. What can you give was the question that it came to me. And I don't know why that's what came to me, but it did. What can you give back to the sport that gave you so much up to this point? That's what my question was. And it was like, well, I've always thought the commentators kind of suck. They never know what they're doing. Maybe I could do that. And so that was literally what was in my head. They're not that good. I think I can do that. Like, maybe I, and what I meant was, I was mad about my own fights. I heard herky jerky a lot. I heard weird. I heard different. And it's like, all I'm doing is martial arts in a new way. And instead of explaining it that way, they're making up phrases that aren't martial arts because they just don't know. Mm. And that's okay. But I was pretty frustrated about that. So I needed to, it was very important to me at that time when I heard the breakdowns of my own fights and how little they knew what I was doing. Like they couldn't explain what I was doing to the masses that bothered me. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I, I can do this. I need to be able to explain to the world the nuances and the real setups and like how much is actually involved in the in this game. It's not just two people beating. There's so I'm so many levels ahead. These guys don't even they're not explaining that I'm step I'm taking two steps for this reason. I'm doing this for this. They don't know. Mm-hmm. So I can do this and I'm gonna fill this gap. And I got to try out on Fox. And this is after I blew my quad out and I had those three months to heal and I gave up and thought I might never fight again. I went on Fox and did a couple tryouts and then I started doing some TV and I was just like, okay, I'll just do this and I'm making money now. So my anxiety went down because at least now I've got income coming in because my sponsors had left me, which mind you, Monster stuck with me. Love Monster for that. Always will. Monster. Hans can suck it and I still want to fight him. But Monster Energy Drink, <laughs> I'll always love and respect. And they did a lot of great things for me. Um, but when it comes to, to that whole situation, like, it was nice to have money. Nice to get paid. And that took away my anxiety and allowed me to focus full time on uh, fighting. And getting, or it allowed, excuse me, it allowed me to focus full time on TV. And then just be with that and then I was doing rehab for my quad but I didn't have like a thing to come back to Mm -hmm. and I didn't have an expectation of a elite level of performance that I had to go face when I came back that's what gets you is like when I come back this guy's training every day and I'm laying on the couch and you're thinking about that every day while you're rehabbing yeah just what all the rest of the division's doing while you're just nothing you can't even lift your leg and it just eats at you So like to have that weight off my chest while I was champion, this is why people retire. Mm -hmm. That's what I learned. (laughs) That's why you get guys who get the title and retire because they don't 
They don't like the pressure. They yeah. can't handle the pressure of being a champion. And so they retire it. And then they come back and say they're the best, but they, they let themselves off the pressure. I got to feel that through injury, not by choice. I felt the relief of the pressure. It was just like, oh, I don't have to. Like, even when I, if I do come back, if it's even possible, who knows? The guy won't, won't be, you know, Uriah Faber, Hen and Barrow. It's going to be somebody I can probably figure it out. So no big deal. Just calm down, make your money, heal yourself. So I did. And then uh, this, and then uh, I healed so fast. And that was one of the fastest healings I've had. And I still made the money. And then I had my fight against Takaya Mizugaki. Yeah, he fought Mizugaki, and I'm remembering basically his head against the cage. You knocked him, uh, TKO'd him. I got him in a minute, yeah. and then two weeks before that fight, I had taken an antibiotic mm -hmm. called Cipro. Starts with the C. Oh, yeah. And Cipro, I mean, at this time, I don't know. You just kind of trust the doctors know what they're doing, which they don't most of the time unless you really check. You have to make sure. And they had given me an antibiotic that said on the directions. So the responsible version of the conversation is read the directions. Don't just trust the doctor. <laughs> so I should have read the label and it says weakens tendons for up to six months after mm -hmm. use. So you take Cipro and it weakens your tendons for up to six months. So I fight. I take it two weeks before the fight. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't weakened anything yet. It just got rid of the staph infection that I had before that fight. So I get cured of the staph infection, fight, win. But then... Three months later, my knee blows out, mm. throwing a high kick. All I'm doing is balancing. I'm balancing on my right leg, and I'm throwing a left high kick. I just switch, throw a left high, and my knee shifts, and it just blows. No contact. Nobody ran into me. There was no wrestling. There was no pre-injury before. I just threw a high kick. So now that's just, both knees. So now it's my other knee, yeah. my right knee. And I'll never forget. I just start. I knew it was busted because of the familiar feeling of the sweat you get when it pops. Mm -hmm. it, it's this certain pain. It's not horrible, but it hurts like hell. And then you just start sweating like you drink a whole bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it just all comes out like it's crazy. And you just like panicked. Like, and I sat down and I looked at Eric and I said, I blew my knee out. And he's like, no, come on, man. No way. No way. And I was like, I did 100%. He's mm -hmm. like, don't worry. Nine months. We'll be back. I don't know. It was the weirdest thing. I remember saying that that day, knowing I know how to do this now because of the quad. When I surrendered, it clicked. Mm. I swear to God, I had no fear. Wow. It, was, it was the weirdest thing. Gosh. And I had so much practice from the first two that like I knew what to do. It was like, oh, easy. I know exactly what to do, like to a T. I'm going to do nothing. I'm, I'm out. And then I'll just heal it. And I know all the rehab and I'll be fine. It was weird. That is weird. I mean, it after all you've weird. been through, you know, just like, ah, oh, nine months, I'll be back. I was in the middle of practice when I did it. But you can't, I had done it so many times, I already knew you can't do anything else. Yeah. That's the thing about it. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's wild that your brain was in a, a place after so much suffering to allow yourself to surrender to the suffering that you're about to go through for nine months. Well, see, this is what's funny about it is it's not suffering because f training is suffering. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm either going to train or I'm going to train either way. I'm training. Yeah. It doesn't change. The game well, I doesn't guess, change. I guess, uh, you know, and maybe you were in a bit of better mental place then, but you know, I guess the suffering, you know, yes, in the training, but you know, the, the, the suffering of the mental game of the recovery. Well, the thing is I had already been through it. Yeah. So it wasn't that to me anymore. Yeah. I had a system. So you were okay with it. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. I had yeah. a complete system. So it didn't hit me like the end of the world anymore. Got it. I knew I had money, had a job. I was going to do TV for the next six months. Yep. Going to rehab for the next six months and not do one sit up and one squat or one curl or one burpee. I wasn't going to do anything other than what the physical therapist told me to do for my knee. And that's it. So I was going to get fat out of shape and live life like a retired fighter. That was my goal. How do you be retired? Or you're going to have to figure this out eventually. That was literally my mentality. Like, you're yeah. not going to fight forever. So you have the opportunity here to know what it's like to retire and lose everything yeah. before you retire. You could still come back. What a gift. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I really, like, saw it that way because I knew what I had been facing already. I had a clear, such a clear vision that it's like retirement. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, it's just practice now. 
you're practicing retirement. Yeah. What would you do? What are you going to do when it's all over? What are you going to do when you lose your passion anywhere in life? Are you just going to quit and give up? Or are you going to adjust and adapt? Yeah. It's not the species that's the smartest that survives the species most adaptable to change. <laughs> yeah. Right? Darwin. So it's like, I don't know, that stuck with me. Yeah. No, that's it's real. That's, that's interesting because um, actually you called me with that quote during COVID. Uh, Love that quote. Yeah, that's a good one. Sixth grade teacher got me into Darwin. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really good one. But, you know, so you recover for nine months and then you come back and you're fighting for the title against TJ Dillashaw, right? How did, did that fight, was it planned? I don't remember. Or did it just kind of happen where you were filling in? Well, I, so I beat Takai Mizugaki mm -hmm. in a minute, blow my knee out again. Mm -hmm. Now I'm out for another year. Yeah. So then I do the rehab work. I'm six months through that rehab mm -hmm. on a boat with my friend Seth Bazinski, and I'm drunk. And Sean Shelby calls me because this is where you learn that they, the doctors know your timeline because you're using the UFC doctors. So you got to start finding your own doctors mm -hmm. so you can keep your own timeline. Another thing I learned. Um, they called me on the six-month week, which is when you know the rehab. The doctor goes, well, six months. I mean, he can start. He's cleared to now start full contact. So they know that now. So they know I'm going to start rehabbing to come back in the next three to five months. Mm -hmm. So they call me to right away because you got to think you've got a hen and burrow that just got beat up by TJ Dillashaw twice. How do you promote the division with the ex champion just losing the belt, getting stripped, not actually, uh, not actually losing it. So, they wanted to make that fight to make, you know, TJ legitimate. Probably, he was a he was an Ultimate Fighter champion, so they'd already dumped a lot of time and money into that brand to build it on the Ultimate Fighter. And then you dump money into building me, so it's an easy fight, you know, make it. And uh, so they, I said yes on the boat that day, mind you, I was 175 pounds. <laughs> And on antidepressants, literally, like, because uh, I talk about how I knew how to handle it, right? I didn't. I just knew I had to stop exercising. So it's like, I knew that and I knew I had a job, but then you still got to deal with life for the next nine months without exercise when that's the only way you've lived your life your entire life. And then there's scientific proof that when you exercise, your brain releases dopamine and other uh, chemicals that keep you happy. They're literal antidepressants mm -hmm. so without those uh, chemicals that i'm used to flooding my systems i hit a deep depression and i think that's what happens to so many athletes and you need tools to deal with these things and i didn't have them and so did the best i could and that's where i i do believe that antidepressants can be there to support you but i don't believe they're the answer mm -hmm. i believe i look at antidepressants as a very viable source of like a floaty mm -hmm. if you're in the ocean and you're drowning Floaty doesn't save you. It just keeps you floating mm -hmm. a little bit, yeah. you know? And that's how I see those. And so I'm grateful that they were there and that my doctor could prescribe them to me during this time of my life because I was just very lost and didn't know what to do with my emotions. And after that nine months or six months, I start, I, after that call, I, I like now I'm nervous. So you start training. And SSL Sports Science Lab with Gavin McMillan helped me so much during these times where I just really could up the training and get my leg to where I needed it. He made my hamstring strong, all the things that mattered at Sports Science Lab. Trained with him, got my body strong again, started training. And then, you know, so he called me at the six-month mark. I trained uh, for two – he gave me to – I think after that moment – I fought, I think, five months later. So. I'm going uh, into that fight. Huge underdog? Yeah. Yeah, I was a big underdog, and I had been talking about TJ a lot, so everybody knew his style. And then he had been emulating my style to prepare Faber and all his team to beat me. Mm -hmm. And so he moved just like me in a lot of ways. And that was super cool because – you know, the thing about TJ is he he was a good champion. It's just it's 
the part that sucks about what happened is it kind of messes up. Like nobody knows what version of him we got, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because of the dirty testing, which, you know, whatever. It's just that's what USADA comes and does. They comes and test and to keep everything clean. And when that happened, I think that's what offends everybody about him. But he is still like has the skill set. He was still a good, great champion. He was still in the sen- in the terms of fighting itself like he was extremely a uh, lethal uh, opponent and so um yeah he had defended the title and to beat him was going to be a is going to take a lot but i i knew his style because he'd built it off of me mm-hmm. so i had a lot of confidence and you got into into his head before the fight too well cuz i knew he was basing his style off me so it's easy to do that if you know what I mean is like what had worked for him to become champion was acting like me in the gym. He had beaten up all his teammates with it to prepare for me. They had prepared them for me. He had been acting, you know, cause you get partners to move the way your opponent moves. Well, he was the one that could do it best and he did it. And it, it was incredible. He used a lot of the tools. It wasn't exactly the same though. Mm-hmm. And I knew what was different <laughs> because it's footwork. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, I, uh, Dwayne Ludwig didn't have the, the same ideals that I did in what I thought of to build it. Mm. And I knew Dwayne Ludwig was a typical Muay Thai guy. So he had ideas and it was a typical Muay Thai base still though. And Muay Thai fights in straight lines. So I always had that in my head is like, I knew Ludwig was his coach and I knew Ludwig didn't know what I was doing. Mm. And so like it, it helped me also with the support of that. Like I just, cause I knew Ludwig was fighting in the UFC while I was coming mm. up. So we were kind of like, Around the same age, me and his coach. Yeah. A little older than me. Dwayne was a good fighter. He was sick. He was a really sick Muay Thai fighter. He was a great coach, too. But I also just knew that those two together weren't smart. Like They're not. I knew I could get um, TJ to mess with Ludwig because Ludwig was looking to live a life vicariously through TJ. Hmm. Like, well, I mean, you know. You uh, like the trash talking was r- really good before that fight. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. I still go back every now and then watch the interview. <laughs> I think it's funny where uh, you were like sitting across from from TJ and he said something and you're like, what? You, you, you basically said, you got to sit here and talk to me. What do you mean? You're not listening to me or whatever. <laughs> it was just like this awkward. <laughs> you almost feel bad for the guy as it was going on. But yeah, uh, it, it was fun. It was like you had you had that mental advantage there and you could kind of tell it there. Like you, it's bothering him more than it should. Yeah. And you know, you could use it to your advantage, but uh, you know, going in that fight, I don't think anybody thought you were going to win. I should have been some people you thought you were going to win, but uh, most people didn't think that you were going to win. And story of my life. Right. Yeah. And you, you know, I look at it now as, you know, really you had the greatest comeback in ufc history you know you were champion uh before you lost your title due to injury you blew both of your knees out one knee you blew out twice you uh tore your quad uh you know you'd broken your hands multiple surgeries seven surgeries and you came back and won the title again i mean that's incredible. If you really think about it, it's freaking incredible. Um, and you know, do, do you have, do you realize how incredible it is? Well, first, thanks for saying that and actually like saying it. It's nice to hear when someone knows that it, what I did was not as easy as it may sound just by saying it. It's like to say it's one thing, but to go through it was like, I, I, when I talk about it, as you can see, I cry because that's probably why I don't talk about it. It was very hard, but also I'm grateful for it, you know? So it's like, I I try not, it's a weird line you play because you could sound victim-y telling it when really I don't feel that way at all. So I don't talk about it a lot, but I know it was difficult. I know it was a lot. I just, Comparison is a thief of joy, right? So I can compare to so many people in the world who've been through so much and kind of sometimes take away the what I've done. I think I do that sometimes. But um when you look at how would you how would you put a waterline on what you're saying that that was a lot and that was hard? Well, when I when I can do that, I would have to look at other sports and see who's done what I've done in other sports, and there's not a lot. 
So that's how I can look at it. Like you look at football players, not a lot of football players with triple ACL reconstruction um, and seven hand surgeries, stuff like that coming back. Um, basketball, uh, soccer, boxing. Like you just don't hear about it. There's a couple. I could I looked him up. Derrick Rose was one of them. But even him, he wasn't at the he didn't come back to win a championship after his after he did that to his knee. Um, and uh, Adrian Peterson was somebody I really was looking up to because he had blown his knee out at the time, and I think it was the second or third time for him. And he came back and was hitting record numbers that season. Yeah, Adrian Peterson was smashing people on the football field after he'd come back. And so that was really inspiring for me. There was little people here and there that I remember looking uh, for feedback from. Yeah. And they supported me. But, yeah, not a lot of people. I didn't have a lot of people to lean on. GSP had hurt and had blown his knee out and come back, but not three times. Um, three times and, in three years. Yeah, not that. Plus a quad. Right. Yeah. So it was a lot. And um, no, I didn't have a lot of people to lean on and ask questions and experience. Most of the time it was what Dana said. You're the most yeah. unlucky person I've ever met in my life. That's usually all you'd hear. Yeah. I don't hear, I don't hear it talked about as much and maybe it's cause you don't talk about it that much, but I've always just found it, you know, you're my friend too, but it, like, I don't think that people really understand what you did because it's one thing to win a UFC title, which is amazing. You know, I, I couldn't have been a UFC champion, but when you do it and you have everything against you, you have three knee surgeries in three years, you know, and you have the, the quad I issue you have, you overcome that and you're still able to compete at that level because you're not as fast as you were 15 years ago. You know, that's like, there's no, there's no way that you can have uh, the same speed as before you had your first surgery or your second surgery after three surgeries. Well, that's what they say, but that's actually not true. Well, I mean, there's not true. I mean, I, I don't, I'm telling you, it's not, I don't, I don't think that you were just as, like ring rust was a real thing too. Well, I, I don't think that you were as fast against I do. Shaw. I do. Uh, as a, well, we, we'll disagree on that one. Yeah. <laughs> but as I was against two, uh, as you were against Faber. Yeah. The I first mean, time. I, yeah, I don't. I mean, you the set, the first time I won. Yeah, in two thousand twelve. First time we won. Yes. So five years later, when I I think two, I, it was only two years later. Well, it, it, there's two thousand fourteen. Yeah, and I understand you don't think you're. So there's nothing wrong with being a little slower. I mean, you get older and you have. Three I just surgeries. don't think I could have beat him if I was slower because TJ was faster than Faber. Yeah, but there's experience too, man. And there's that you're what 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 you have is a, a crazy will to win. You hate mm -hmm. losing more than just about anybody I know. Um, and you're super strategic. So it's not just all speed. You mm -hmm. know, what you might yeah, have lost true. in speed, you gained in all of these other things, experience, mm -hmm. understanding that you could overcome adversity to the highest level to fight for another title even. Just to get to that point, you're uh, breaking, you know, uh, all the odds. So, uh, and I, I've always thought, I mean, it's, it's just, it's an incredible feat when you really break down all of those, you know, all of those things. And, uh, I think what's hard for me is just how, how impossible it was said to be while I was about to do it. And then how little people say about it when it's done. Well, I think that's what blows my mind the most about humans. Yeah. Is like all I heard for years was how there's no way you're going to come back the same. You're going to be slower. Ring rust is going to mess you up. And all I said for years was what you're saying right now is not true. And what they were saying then wasn't true. I know I'm as fast as I was then. Now I'm not. Then I was. Now I'm not because I'm 38. Then I was only 28 or something. 2015, I yeah. I was still in my 20s. So it's like I knew for me, I had even with my knee surgeries, with what I was doing at Sports Science Lab, I was positive I might have been faster. Interesting. Honest to God, not slower. And my knees are stronger now, just like my hands, than they were originally yeah because my what you learn when you do a, a rebuild the way i've done so many times is you strip the muscle completely to the bone every time you you do a rebuild so when you strip something down to the bone it's like take a car and gut it and put brand new stuff in it mm -hmm. like doesn't mean it's slower it's the same frame it's just you put new stuff in it so it's like i i came back more flexible 
with better range of motion and stronger legs than when I got hurt originally. Yeah. And then all the rest mixed into it. I think it really like my legs feel, my knees feel great. They're a little achy here and there Mm -hmm. on certain days, but stability wise, they're stronger than they ever were. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have an actual way to prove that you're wrong or that I'm right. I don't really care, but it's more like, I don't know if that was true that I was slower, you know, either way, whether you were or weren't to me, you were to you, you weren't, that doesn't even matter. Really. It's just the point that, you know, you, you overcame all that and against all odds doing something that, I mean, to me, if I were just to be a UFC champion one day, I'd been like, oh my God, you know, but to do it after all of those injuries, it's like not, it's not, I don't think most people, I don't think most people know what you went through, like to the point of how many surgeries, even me, I was like, how many was it before we, you know, we've gone over, we've talked about a lot of this stuff before. I honestly need to go back and look at my medical history (laughs) because I stopped trying to know. Yeah. You just don't want to know anymore. And I stopped counting it like 10, 11, 12. I mean, seven on my hands, so many on my knees. I've had shoulder reconstructive surgery since then. I've broke my nose a second time since then. I've broken my ulna. I've broken my feet, my ribs. And I have a um, bone spur in my neck and my ankle. So those are like after that have had have had to my fight career. Sure. After I won the title. Yeah. And I'm still here. So it's like I think people need to know that how tough the human body really is. Yeah. Like it, and that's one of the things I really they drove me to is like you guys are all don't know what you are capable of, honestly. Well, is, is it so it is the human body, but it's also, you know, the human mind. Because you've had to have a really strong mind to even you know, even overcome all of those things. I appreciate that you notice it. And like, cause I, not a people, that's kind of what I mean. You've been through so much yourself, Ed, that it takes somebody who's been through hell and back to see somebody who's been through hell and back. And that's the irony of the situation. And there's so little people like that these days that a lot of people don't notice what I've done. I agree. You have to go through hell. Yeah. Like you've scooped shit out of toilets and taking them up flights of scare, stairs to have your dream come true. Not a, I don't know how many people have done that. I'm not saying they haven't, but I don't know if the numbers are higher on average of people who have gone for it at the level that I've seen you go for it. I could say the same stuff about you with your business. So it's like we're mirrors for each other, and I think that part of the difficulty about doing impossible great things is there's not a lot of people around you who will notice you're doing impossible great Mm. things unless they've done it themselves with you or around you or near you because we're all mirrors for one another. And if I can't see myself in you, then I don't know if I can see it. It's hard to see it because I'm looking through my own scope. Yeah. And it's like all the greatness I see in you, I've seen it somewhere. Where did I see it first? In yourself. Usually... From my experience in humans, we it starts with us, and then, and then we we give it to other things. But realistically, we're the source of everything we create. So it's like I think that all the greatness I see in you, all this fancy stuff, all this is all stuff I see in me. I just haven't taken the steps to go create. <laughs> and I'm grateful that you have done it because you pushed us to create it. Little things like that. But it's like, how would I see these things? How you like these things? They're special to you but I've been through enough stuff that I know how hard it is to get a little C thing like that. It probably costs five grand. That looks expensive. I would never pay five grand for something like that. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Like you just, it's because I've been around these things that I know how difficult it is to have the things you have. Yeah. And to have built the business you built to be sitting here and do this podcast with you. Like we went through hell. Yeah. Hell. We did. It wasn't easy, man, but you know, know. so that's, I think that what I'm trying to say is that's why you see it. So I don't know if I can expect, we, I can't do all this to expect people to see it. No, I know that. I I just, well, just so you know, I see it and you know, Scott, well, your, your close friends see it. And, um, you know, I, I do wish people, other people could see it or just really know because it's inspirational when you really, cause you you downplay it or really you just don't make a big deal of it, but it, it's it's just if people could realize that the body and the mind 
can do these yeah. incredible things. You weren't just a UFC champ. Most you were a UFC champion before the injuries, maybe a couple injuries along the way, but you know, but after three years of surgeries nonstop and depression and frustration and anger and all of these things, loneliness, you were super lonely then. Super. And I created all of it. You did, but you, you overcame all of that and became champion. Yeah, I you know, I can't think of another story either, like like yours, uh, where where it's been done. And you really, you know, it, it is inspirational because, you know, it's it's proof that you can do anything if you put your, you know, put your mind to it. Well, thank you. Hearing you say it makes me realize why I'm ashamed is because I'm also the most hurt UFC champion in history. <laughs> the most or the most injured? Yeah. So then gee, there's always like a double-edged sword, right? And so like when you're someone like me, that's why I don't talk about it because I don't like talking about all the stuff that I failed at in order to be cool or whatever, yeah. like inspirational. I wouldn't even be inspirational if I hadn't – like who knows what I would have – how many times could I have defended the title successfully if I didn't you have – You wouldn't have lost for – You go all those years. routes, you know? You wouldn't have lost for years. But, um, you know, the – it's the cards that you were you were dealt. Yeah, yeah, you get what and, you get. Um, you know, way you wouldn't have it any other way because it's made you who you are today. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm grateful, you know. And yeah, same with you and your business. That's why I've. It's been cool to watch you succeed as well. Yeah, man. It's yeah. You know, talking about grateful, I think gratitude is underrated. You know, I really do. I think that like living in gratitude all the time is something that people could could learn a lot from and i know that, that, that you do it uh you're pretty much kind of always grateful which is really i'm not gonna say it's changed the last few years but you're you're constantly living outward focus and in gratitude and, and aware of what that means yeah it's um when you hit depression the way i have you gotta find new ways that make, to make things work and that's probably one of the biggest things that i've been able to adjust is just creating my own experience through those those things responsibility gratitude trust love vulnerability these things like i never would have used in the sense in my life about six years ago <laughs> and now i use them every day otherwise i'll die i won't i'll seen what it creates it created a lot of pain in my life and so i had to shift different ways of being i had to shift who i was being i you know if you want if you want flowers and rose bushes all around you, then you've got to be the environment that, that can sustain flowers and rose bushes. And if you're a desert, then you're going to get scorpions, snakes, yellow monsters, cactuses, thousand degree heat, and no water. Uh, in my past, I would say I was coming from a desert. And today I'd say I'm coming from something a little bit more fruitful. I don't know if it's to, to uh, accommodate a rose bush, but I think you get what I'm trying to, what I'm getting at is like, I have to be the source of the environment that I create around me. And then I create the environment. Uh, before I think I was kind of waiting, f I was kind of blaming life for happening to me in a lot of ways. I was saying that mm, the world was the desert and I'm the rose bush <laughs> and I don't belong in this world. When really I was the desert trying to force rose bushes to grow mm. and they didn't belong there until I changed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, really with that shift and kind of changing to be aware of all that and being outward focused, um, you know, what would you say, like, what would you say was the catalyst, uh, like the aha moment, like within there? Mm, probably seeing, uh, like, when I started giving back to the community more, I didn't know uh, there was like, I um, I started really tapping into people that were doing bigger things than me and, and that I looked up to much older than me, like 60, 70 year olds that had just lived 30 years longer than me, 40 years longer than me. And they just kind of knew what I'd gone through and I got to tap into them and have them put me in directions. And then when I started following these directions, instead of like, them giving me destinations that I needed to be at and that would be right. It was just go in this direction and see what could be created. When I started going in these positive directions, I, st I came to the culmination of this that, uh, you know, like 
everything in our life is about relationships. The quality of our life is the quality of relationships. And I wasn't building any of them. I had shut myself separate from the world to win. And when you win, you're on right island. You're right. You're winning. But there can only be one person on that island with you because you're right and you're winning. Mm -hmm. And there's only one way to win and only one right way. And so nobody else is invited. It's just you. And you're right. And you got all the things that come with being right, but you're alone. So I started to learn, like, I can be right or I can be with. I have a choice. So choosing to be with and start building relationships and be that environment by reaching out to build the relationships with other people and being a source of love and giving to other people and then getting them to stand for themselves and their own dreams and the things that they want, getting people to follow the stuff that they want the way that I followed what I want because maybe they didn't have the mindset for it or they didn't think they could do it. Giving those things back to the community filled that hole that I had inside of me, which was you know, I need a hot girlfriend and I need a Lamborghini and I need a mansion and I need a uh, billion dollars in my account and then I'll be happy. Well, I mean, I had a point where I didn't have that much, but I had all the things that I thought I would need and I wasn't happy. And so I realized, okay, that's not it. That was the blessing of being a world champion and then losing everything and then getting it again and then losing it again is like you get to see the differences. And I realized that the quality of your life through all those ups and downs of having the title and all that is the quality of your relationships, who you have to share all those things with, who you have to. And you hear this all the time from people, but that's you're asking me what I learned. And this is where the joy comes from is when you start to when I started to figure out that I I get to give before I and then that's everything. Um, and by giving, that means just like having people understand what they can have that they're not giving to themselves mm -hmm. and ex supporting people and giving themselves the love that they deserve to have for themselves. That even makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does. And, you know, uh, another thing that you were kind of talking about earlier, you hit on was you, you were a victim to your circumstances for a minute before, and you've, you're, you're now responsible for everything. And why is that important? What does that even mean? Um, well, coming from what I've learned, like, is that uh, coming from responsibility is a choice. It's not an actual fact. So it's like, I can't actually factually always be responsible because I'm a human. Uh, as a human, I'm not always going to be responsible. We have times where we go out and we blame, right? It's just the human condition to be in survival and blame others before we take responsibility. I get that. But as I've chosen as a clear intention to always come from responsibility i can notice when i'm not and choose responsibility anyways and that's a huge 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 it's been a huge life-changing experience for me because i always have the power to shift and change things now it's like that was the biggest thing for me is being able to always have the power in my hand it just that notion shifted everything for me is knowing it's not a fact i'm not saying Ed, like if I was to tell you, I'm not saying you're always going to be responsible, that you can factually always be responsible, but you could choose to always be responsible, mm -hmm. right? To about everything. Well, why would I do that? I'm not responsible for everything in the world. I get that hypothetically. I get that. But that's where I'm saying I got my power because now that I am responsible for everything, I always have something I can do yep. no matter what happens to me. Like let's say right now you stand up and slap the shit out of me in the middle of this interview. And we start fighting, I win. Well, that's the thing. You slap me, so we don't start fighting unless I come from victimhood. Okay. That's what I'm that's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. So, like, let's say you slap me, you stand up, you slap me in the middle of this. I wouldn't have any idea why you did that. Right. My first reaction is kill you mm -hmm. because I'm a victim of you slapping me. But what I've learned is I'm kind of dangerous sometimes. And so I can't always choose that. You go to court, you go to jail, you'll lose. One, that's just one indication. But beyond that, it's like I don't have any power now. Now, because you slapped me, I'm going to lose control, which now gives all my control to you because you triggered me. You got me to beat you up. I didn't beat you up because I wanted to. I beat you up because you made me by slapping me. So when I started to realize, like, it's actually me handing you my power by beating you up after you slapped me because that's what you wanted, I stopped fighting you. I stopped giving you my power. I'm responsible for how I react. So if you slap me, I sit down here and I go, I'm not going to lie. I've killed people for less. I'm going to have to understand why you just did that to me. And you would say, well, you said something that really offended me. And anybody who said that word last time I slapped. Okay. What was the word? 
Well, the word was the. <laughs> okay, so you slap anybody who says the word the. Okay, why? And we get down into it. Long story short, we're not fighting. Mm-hmm. I'm responsible for my reaction. I no longer hand my power over to you. That's a tiny example that sounds silly, but factually, I should be punching you. Factually, I, sh- I have the right, and I'm right, that you deserve to get stomped out. No question. Everybody in the world would agree with me, but coming from responsibility, I get to choose, like, all right, how did I create this? Yeah. How did I create you slapping me? Not you just slapped me because you wanted to. What did I do to create this? Well, you did say something about guys with curly hair being a little bit weird looking earlier. Maybe he heard that. Like, <laughs> you just never know where it goes, right? Yeah. So it's like, that's a joke, obviously, but it's like, man, I don't know what I, how I could have created it. So for me, being responsible has given me all my power, and then it, it allows me to not get triggered by other people so much. It allows me to not just lose my crap, lose my shit on people. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, man, it's been great hanging out and talking to you, kind of going over everything. It's been fun watching you evolve all these years and, uh, you know, really bring something, you know, not only to the fighting world that's different with your style. We didn't get to talk too much about your style, which is a whole other genius level, I think, that of, of your game. Uh, but you know, your mindset, we get to talk about your mindset and the evolution of that to where you are now. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be fun even to see what you do in the future. I mean, this, the future is bright. You're going to do good, good at whatever you do. Um, it's still fighting obviously, but, um, yeah, it's just been, it's been fun being your friend all these years, Dom. Damn, man. It's been cool watching you build a business and, I always say, like, I built it fighting. You built it in an actual business. You built mm-hmm. all your success, all this. And it's like that super difficult. So I, I love that we have that to share, that we can lean on each other in two completely different parallel universes yeah. and learn so much from those universes. And they work together in a certain way, too. Absolutely. So that's what yeah, I enjoy having a cool friend like you that still winning and being bougie for the rest of us. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> all right. Thank you, brother. Thanks, man.